This video is a bit unusual. It started out as just a little follow-up to my previous video, but as I encountered more and more weird performance quirks, it quickly grew into something bigger. And soon I found myself explaining how modern CPUs execute code and how that affects performance. So I hope that sounds interesting to you. And by the way, you might want to watch the previous video first, in case you haven't already. Anyway, we're just gonna get started at the beginning. Why I even decided to make a follow-up to the previous video in the first place. Last time I explained how CPython used a stack-based virtual machine, while my scripting language used a register-based VM. And I claimed that my language was faster because of this difference. But many of you pointed out that this comparison wasn't exactly fair. The two languages also had many other differences, any of which could have explained the performance difference. Later in this video, we'll explore the stack versus register performance question from a more technical side. For now, let's start with a quick recap. In the last video, I explained how Python's VM executes C equals A plus B. It first had to push A and B onto the stack, then add and finally copy the result into C, whereas my register-based VM could do all of this in one step. But what I forgot to mention was that it didn't always work this way. Initially, my compiler was rather stupid. The bytecode it generated for C equals A plus B used to look like this, copy, copy, add, copy. It did exactly the same thing as Python. And when my compiler generated this suboptimal register code, my language's performance was actually very close to that of Python. Only when I improved the compiler to generate better code, did my language actually beat Python. This is why I claimed my language was faster because of the register VM. I assumed Python's stack-based code was also already well optimized. But Gordon wasn't so sure. He suggested that the problem may not be that the Python bytecode is stack-based, but that it is completely awful stack-based code. Here's the other function from the video again. Gordon explained that all of these loads and stores weren't actually necessary. The bytecode could have just been add add return. And this got me wondering, how far could optimizing the code push a stack VM's performance? To investigate this, I wrote two simple VMs, one stack-based and one register-based. I then manually created optimized bytecode and compared the performance on various CPUs. But I'll be honest, I wasn't too surprised by the results. The register VM was still about two times faster than the stack VM, even with the optimized stack code. But whenever you optimize something, you should always make sure your optimization actually improves performance instead of simply adding complexity, or worse, making things slower. Here's the loop body of the optimized stack-based Fibonacci function, and this is the body of the naive version, with those extra loads and stores. Just looking at this code, it should be pretty clear that the optimized version will be faster, right? It has half as many instructions after all. Well, let me tell you, the results weren't as clear. On the modern x86 chips, the naive version was slightly faster, even though it had double the number of instructions, but what's perhaps even more surprising is how large the gap between the two versions was on the M1 Pro, compared to the other chips. Now, one benchmark doesn't tell us that much, so I also implemented different versions of a Mandelbrot set function. Here, the results were a bit more coherent, but still, not what you'd expect at all. The naive version was faster across the board, even though, again, it's much more code. The conundrum seems to be, how could using more instructions make the code any faster? Before we investigate that though, I should probably explain how these implementations even work. We have two variables, a and b, and in each iteration, a becomes b and b becomes a plus b. In the naive version, we first compute b's new value, then copy b into a, and finally store the sum in b. For the optimized version, we take advantage of the fact that a and b are at the top of the stack. So here we can already compute b's new value by adding, but now we've lost b's old value. So instead, first make a copy of B's value, then do a fancy rotation, which conveniently places B at the bottom and leaves A and B at the top. Now we just add and we're done. Here are both versions side by side. It looks like the smart version is doing less work, right? The actual assembly code confirms this. The smart version is indeed more efficient. Still, it's slower. That, my friend, is the beauty of modern CPUs. To understand what the hell is going on here, let's take a break and go to the kitchen. Same preparing lunch. I need to cut vegetables and fry them, cook rice, and cook this steak. I could do all of these things one at a time. Cut the veggies, fry them, wait, heat water for the rice, wait, cook the rice, wait. Finally, fry the steak. And now it's midnight. Hope you enjoy your meal. Now obviously you wouldn't do that. Instead, you would overlap independent work. While cutting the veggies, I can already heat the water for the rice. One activity requires the cutting board, the other one the stove. No problem. But while the water is heating up, I obviously can't cook the rice yet. These two are not independent. Right, you get the idea. See, a modern CPU isn't that different from a kitchen. It also has various components, as well as a controller that orchestrates everything. Here's a really simple program. 
It just adds the values in registers 6 and 9 and stores the result in R2. To execute this, first the instruction is decoded and moved into the controller. From there, it is dispatched to the math unit where it is executed. Finally, the result is written back to the register file and the instruction is retired. And like in the kitchen, we can overlap independent work. But things quickly start to clog up if there are dependencies between the instructions. Here we're summing the values in registers 1 through 8. And because each instruction uses the result of the previous one, this has to be done one at a time. However, by changing the summation order, we can introduce more independent work. And here that seems to make quite the difference. But can we actually measure this on a real CPU? Here are two functions written in Rust. They sum up the values in an array, adding four values to the total in each iteration. The difference is that one version uses only a single sum variable, while the other one uses four partial sums and adds them up at the end. As we now know, the additions done by the version on the right are independent, as they use different variables, so the CPU can execute them in parallel. But the other additions form a dependency chain, so they have to be executed sequentially. And it turns out this is quite a measurable difference. We actually get a perfect four times speedup for the version on the right. A quarter the execution time for the same number of instructions. This is also reflected by VTune's pipeline utilization diagram, where basically more green means more good. This bottom part of the diagram can be caused by instruction dependencies, which is what's going on here. Although VTune incorrectly reports the L1 cache as the primary bottleneck. Maybe these memory operands are confusing it, I'm not quite sure. Anyway. Just to demonstrate how far you can push a summation function, here's a version using 8 vectorized partial sums. And it's 26 times faster than the original function, and has a very green diagram. However, it's worth noting that all of these programs compute slightly different results, as floating point addition is order dependent. This is also why the compiler doesn't do this optimization on its own, at least not for floating point numbers. Alright, so far we've learned that physical CPUs can execute multiple instructions in parallel, if these instructions use non-conflicting registers. Now let's try to apply this to our virtual machines. Here are two programs for the register-based VM. They both add up the values in registers 0 through 15, and much like in the example from the CPU simulator, one version always adds into register 0, while the other one repeatedly adds up independent pairs. Now, here's a question for you. Will there also be a difference in performance between these two VM programs? I'll give you a second to think about it. Okay, if you thought the version on the right would be faster, you'd be, well, correct, actually. But if you thought too hard about it, you're probably pretty confused right now. Because, given what we know so far, this wasn't exactly guaranteed to happen. See, these programs both execute 15 add instructions and one return. But remember, those are virtual machine instructions implemented by the same code in the interpreter loop. Which means that not only do these two programs execute the same number of instructions, they actually execute exactly the same machine code. In particular, they even use all the same registers. So how could one version be faster than the other? Well, the only difference that's left is which VM registers the two programs use. And because those live in memory, the only difference is which memory locations these instructions access. And it turns out that memory locations behave similarly to registers, meaning instructions that read and write to the same memory location interfere with each other while instructions that use different memory locations are independent. Here's a visualization of the two programs. The faster one on the right reads and writes different memory locations, so these operations can be overlapped, while the slower one on the left repeatedly accesses register 0, meaning all of its operations need to be executed sequentially. And if we flip this animation upside down, you may start to see why the stack-based virtual machine was always slower than the register-based one. Whenever the stack-based VM performs any kind of operation, it always sits at the top of the stack. This is problematic because it can create false dependencies between otherwise independent operations. Here, for example, the two multiplications are theoretically independent, but because they use overlapping memory locations, they actually become coupled and can't be executed in parallel. Not only does the register-based VM avoid these false dependencies by being able to operate on arbitrary values, but it also needs fewer instructions in total, which means less interpretation overhead. That's why the register-based VM is faster. But now let's go back to the question why the naive stack-based code was faster than the optimized stack code. In the Mandelbrot set function, one important difference are these instruction pairs here. Load followed by duplicate in the smart version, and load followed by load in the naive version. Both instruction sequences do the same thing, push two copies of a variable to the top. But the issue with load followed by dupe is that the duplicate requires the result of the load, so they're dependent, while the two loads in the naive version are independent. The other differences are about smart stack shuffling to avoid copies, like in the Fibonacci function. The issue here is that, in the smart version, every instruction touches memory written by the previous one, so they're all dependent. And while the naive version has more instructions in total, the longest dependency chain is actually also just three instructions long. 
On top of that, the rotate instruction is somewhat expensive compared to the other instructions here. So that's why the naive version is faster on some CPUs. But remember, it was actually worse on the old Intel CPU and a lot worse on the modern M1 Pro. On the Mac, this seems to be caused by significantly higher per instruction overhead. According to the instruments profiler, 90% of the time is spent up here in the dispatch code. While this number can't exactly be accurate, it is definitely an indicator for what's going on. The number of instructions matters much more than on the new x86 chips. Okay, we've covered quite a bit of ground in this video, but really, we've barely only scratched the surface of how modern CPUs work. If you want to learn more, I recommend you check out this lecture series, link in the description. Oh, and whether any of this applies to my language or Python is also a bit unclear. In any case, I hope you learned something today, and if you did, why not share this video with a friend? Alright, I'll see you in the next one, whenever that's gonna be.